could be thunder, could be the wind, or it could be the force. If you ever seen Star Wars or something, may the force be with you. But it ain't the God of the Bible. Everybody understand that? Be sure and read that. I just got this this week from Pew uh, Survey. I think that you'll find it most interesting. And then this article here, I didn't make a copy of it. But I'm just going to read some of it to you. 80% of Americans believe in God. Pew found out what they mean. We believe in God, Amy, Amy uh, Grant famously saying in the 90s, today, four out of five Americans still say the same. But according to a new survey from the Pew Research Center, what they mean by God varies. What they mean by God varies. Pastors and theologians often warn Christians against ascribing to a God of their own making, knowing that not all who say they believe understand God as described in the scriptures in the tradition in the traditional creeds of the church in the shifting spiritual landscape of the United States Christians too can no longer assume that their friends and neighbors believe in the God of the Bible if they believe in God at all Though God regularly gets invoked in prayer, platitudes and phrases like God bless America and in God we trust, Americans even within Christianity have different concepts of who God is and how he operates. Does God judge? Does God love all? Does God control what happens in the earth? Most don't believe that, that last statement. They are deist. And deists believe that when, oh yeah, they, God created the world, he created the universe, then he, he, he wound it like a clock and set it loose. And now it runs on its own. Whatever happens is just mother nature. <laughs> but not God. God does not intervene in those kind of things. This is the God of people today. Very interesting. So the question that we ought to find, we ought to be asking ourselves this question. How did we get here? I'm talking about how did we get here in this day of apostasy? In this day of spiritual coldness, how did we get here? Well, I believe this prayer that I'm going to read to you this morning, I believe it will help you to find some answers. To illustrate how bad the situation is, let me share with you the story of a prayer. The story began in 1995 when a great prayer was written by Bob Russell, who at the time was pastor of Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky, one of our nation's largest churches. The prayer was written in response to an invitation to pray at a breakfast hosted by the governor of Kentucky. A year later, on January 23, 1996, 
Joe Wright, who at the time was pastor of Central Christian Church in Wichita, Kansas, decided to deliver the same prayer with some minor changes before the House of Representatives of the Kansas Legislature. It generated nationwide attention when the Democrat leaders in the legislature called a press conference and condemned the prayer. Later, when it was read by Paul Harvey on his radio program, it prompted the largest response in the history of the program as thousands wrote in requesting copies of the prayer. Here is the prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today to ask your forgiveness and seek your direction and guidance. We know your word says, woe to those who call evil good, but that's exactly what we've done. We have lost our spiritual equilibrium and inverted our values. We confess that we have ridiculed the absolute truth of your word and call it moral pluralism. We have worshipped other gods and call it multiculturalism. We have endorsed perversion and called it an alternate lifestyle. We have exploited the poor and called it the lottery. We have neglected the needy and called it self-preservation. We have rewarded laziness and called it welfare. We have killed our unborn and call it freedom of choice. We have shot abortionists and called it justifiable. We have neglected to discipline our children and called it building esteem. We have abused power and called it political savvy. We have coveted our neighbor's possession and called it ambition. We have polluted the air with profanity and pornography and called it freedom of expression. We have ridiculed the time-honored value of our forefathers and called it enlightenment. Search us, O oh God, and know our hearts today. Try us and see if there be some wicked way in us. Cleanse us from every sin and set us free. Guide and bless these men and women who have been sent here by the people of Kansas and who have been ordained by you to govern this great state. Grant them your wisdom to rule and may their decisions direct us to the center of your will. I ask this in the name of your Son, the living Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. That was, prayer was prayed in 1996. It surely needs to be prayed more today, don't you think? Everybody got a handout this morning called the Judicial Assault. Now, I'm not going to read the entire article because I gave you a copy of it, but what I want you to notice is what is in dark, bold letters about the center of the page. Now, I asked the question, how did we get here? How did we get here? I'm talking about how did we get to this modern age of apostasy? How did we get here? It wasn't overnight. Number one, Engel versus 
Vitale in 1962. The Supreme Court outlawed prayer in the public schools. Now, brother and sister, first off, I want you to understand this legislation here that passed did not go through Congress, which is, is the body of our government that introduces and makes laws. Everybody understand? It makes laws. That's what its job is to do. The Supreme Court was never installed to make laws. It was to install to rule on laws to see if they were constitutional or not. They do not make laws, but our Supreme Court has taken that upon themselves, and the Congress let them do it and get away with it. You understand? So we see that the first modern thing here that our Supreme Court done they outlawed prayer in schools. That's just the first. How many here lately have seen have seen news where some football coach uh, prayed with this team? I don't care if it's in a public school or a college. If they play pray publicly, brother, they take them to the cleaners. How many have seen that? Number two. Roe versus Wade. In 1963, the Supreme Court passed this law. The court legalized abortion. Now, remember that when I remember when that was passed, it said it was introduced and passed to keep women that were raped or molested. That's where abortion came in. But now you can get abortion for any, don't have to have any reason, just like no fault divorce, you know. You can get it just because you want it, abortion. You see what I'm saying? Number three, Stone versus Graham in 1980. The court outlawed the posting of the Ten Commandments in schools. Oh, we don't want our, our students to be corrupted with those Herenius, uh terrible Ten Commandments. Why, somebody might believe them. And what's happened in the schools? You know, this is where it all started. Now, what is the recall? What is the repercussions at that schools have been reaping the judgments of their decision? Huh? How many school shootings have you heard of since this? all these laws passed? Well, every day almost, every week. I tell you, you don't mock God. Number four, Lawrence and Gardner versus the state of Texas in 2003. The court struck down anti-sodomy laws and thus legalized homosexual behavior. Remember now, that's just a start. All they do, just get in there, get their foot in the door, and then watch. On the back table back there, I, I told you last week about what's happened in California. They're passing a law. Uh, House bill is going to the the uh, state senate of, of California, and no doubt it will pass. Let me ask you this question: Do you know why it will pass? What? What is, is hun? What is the bill they're voting on? Okay, you cannot. In writing, in word, in actions, speak evil of any bisexual, transgender, or homosexual acts. If this bill passes, they'll certainly outlaw the Bible because the Bible speaks against it, right? Now, why 
Let me ask you, going back to my question, why will this bill pass? Because they have a one-party system in, Air, uh, in uh, California. And guess what that party is? That's right. You say, oh, they, they got Republican. Yeah, but there's no... The, the Democrats far out number the Republicans. It's, so it's called a one-party government in, in California. And Jerry Brown, the governor, is the head of it, you know. And he's as liberal as the day is long. And that bill's going to pass. And boy, I tell you, it's got the religious leaders. It's got, there's Bible, a lot of Bible schools and colleges in California. A lot of big churches out there. And they're really concerned about that bill. And there ain't no doubt it's going to pass. Now, remember what I said? That's just the first step. That homosexual crowd don't quit, and they're not going to quit. Number five, Orgefeldt versus Hodges. In 2015, the court legalized same-sex marriages. The reason I wanted you to have a copy of that because you might want to keep that. Good for your records because, so brother and sister, it's pretty plain where we're at today in the spiritual climate of America. Now, let's all turn our Bibles or, I don't know this, you know the last time I preached on this was uh, the 25th of last month. But I'm going to go, I want to read my text if, uh, if you uh, don't have it, or if you have it, fine, you can follow me, but it is found in, in Jude, verses 10 through 13. Let's all stand as we uh, go to the Word of God. Jude verses 10 through 13. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beast. In those things they corrupt themselves. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Father God, in Jesus' name, we come to the throne of grace this morning. Thank you, God, for this opportunity that we have to gather ourselves together and open your blessed book and to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. We thank you, Lord, for that liberty, knowing, God, that it door is quickly closing. We understand, Lord, that in the end time, that there would be a famine in the land, not of, for bread nor for water, but for hearing of the word of the Lord. God, we realize and know that surely, Lord, that we are living in the end time. It has come upon us. God, many of us, Lord, it has, it has really caught us unawares. We, we, we never knew that it would go this far. God, we're thankful, Lord, that even, Lord, in this dark day of deception, 
in this dark day of falling away and people's hearts are turned against the things of God, we know, Lord, that your word will come to pass. It will be according to thus saith the Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the revelation of your word, Lord. Thank you, Father, that you have given us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of thee. I pray, Father God, this morning that you'll help us as we share the blessed truths of your word. I pray, Lord, you'll open the eyes of our understanding that we'll, oh God, shake ourselves, all of us, Lord, that we will become more aware of the deceiving hour in which we live. Oh, God, help us, Lord. Revive us again, we pray. We ask these favors in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to call your attention to verse number 11. Woe unto them, for they have gone the way of Cain and ran greedily after the heir of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Cory. Now I want you to notice that word gainsaying. What does that word mean? You know, it's, uh, I heard a new, a new uh, definition. Well, it really isn't new, but it was the first time that I've, seen it used or heard it used. This person, they were describing who they were on Facebook and they began to tell things about themselves and one of the things that they said that they were, they were a naturalist. A naturalist. I, so that kind of caught me off guard. What is a naturalist? So I go to the uh, dictionary, and I looked and I found the word naturalist. And naturalism is a teaching that there's nothing supernatural. Everything that happens, it's just nature. It's just Mother Nature is in control of this. They call it Mother Nature. Uh, that's another term that is satanic. It does everything but give God any recognition. You understand? Natural. As natural brute beasts, see? They just believe what they can see, touch, feel, and hear, and, and feel. Those Just a naturalist. And brother, that's what we have today in this new age. It's a new age teaching that everything happens by nature. But to gainsay is to contradict, to oppose in words, to deny or declare not to be true what another says, to controvert, to dispute applied to persons or to propositions, declare, declaration or facts. And this is what this last, we've talked about the uh, way of Cain. And we talked about the heir of Balaam. And this morning we want to deal our time with the gainsaying of Corey. What was the gainsaying of Corey? And the scripture says, woe to them that perish in the gainsaying of Corey. Now let's turn to Numbers chapter 16 in your Bible. If you brought your Bible, turn to Numbers chapter 16. Numbers. Numbers chapter 16. Now, you know, I, uh, I made a statement. I made a statement, uh, I think, last Sunday that 
You know, the Lord's dealing with me about a message about the agents, the agents of God. The more I think about that, the more there's one thing that uh, most people that read the Old Testament don't have a clue what it's all about. And all they read about is war and people killing one another and this and that. And they, they just don't understand it. And then here comes Jesus on the scene. And they say, well, I can accept Jesus, but I can't accept that Old Testament because it's just full of war. Listen close. When God was revealing himself to Moses, he says, I have heard the cry of my people. I have seen their, their situation, paraphrasing, and I have come down to deliver them. Then he goes on, and I am using you. You're going to be the agent that I'm going to work through. When God does anything, it's normally he uses it. He has an agent, a representative of his will. You understand? That's it. When you understand that God was using Israel in the office of judgment, these nations that was in the land that day was absolutely anti-God. They was antichrist. I mean, they worshiped all kinds of evil things. They give their they give their children to the God of Moloch, which was the God of fire, and they roasted them, and thinking they were approaching God. You understand? They had they had a false conception of God. They had no revelation of God. Because God only gave his revelation of his divine self and person to the elect. Can I hear him? Amen. Who was that elect? Abraham. God chose one man to reveal himself through. And then he went Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right on down the line. But God was, the world, rest of the world didn't know. They worshiped all uh, all kinds of false deities. You know what? That angered God. So he used Israel as his arm of destruction on those nations. Everybody understand that? So when you read the, when you read the Old Testament, you'll understand they were simply doing what God desired them to do. Now in the 16th chapter of Numbers... Let's look, I want to, I'm, there's 50 verses here, so I don't want to go through all 50 of them, but I want to lay a foundation here to where you'll get some sense out of what's going on. Now, Korah, the son of Azhar, the son of Kodath, the son of Levi, and Dathan, and Ab Abram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peli, Sons of Reuben took men. Oh, I love these names, don't you? <laughs> and I trust that I got pretty close. And if not, you, 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 you interpret it yourself, okay? And they rose up before Moses. Now notice what these guys done. They rose up before Moses with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the assembly, Famous in the congregation, men of renown. Not just the regular folks, but these guys, they were the top of the cream. 250 of them. <clears throat> and they gathered themselves together against Moses. Brother, if you can't get to God, then get the one that represents God. And against Aaron, and said unto them, 
You take too much upon you, seeing all the congregations are holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Wherefore, then lift you up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord. What do you mean, taking the authority over the whole congregation? We're all holy. We're all children of God. I dare you to speak like you're the only one that knows the will of God. You think you're the only one that's right. How many times I've had people throw that at me? <laughs> yeah. You think you're the only one that's right. Well, if you don't think that about yourself, you better dig, dig in the book. And when Moses heard it, he fell upon his face. And he spake unto Korah and all the, unto all the company, saying, Even tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he hath chosen will he cause to come near unto him. And he told him, he said, to, let's read on. Take your senses, Korah, and all his company, and put fire therein, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow, and it shall be that the man whom the Lord doth choose, he shall be holy. You take too much upon you, you sons of Levi. All right, let's drop down here to, uh, to number, uh, verse number 12. And Moses sent to all Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Elab, which said, We will not come up. We're not going to. I know you said to come up here, Moses, but hey, we're, we're through obeying you. We're not coming up. We're not going to submit to your authority. Are you all with me? All right. And Moses, verse 16, And Moses said unto Kor, Be thou and all thy company before the Lord, thou and they and Aaron tomorrow, and take every man his censer, and put incense in them, and bring you before the Lord, every man his censer, 250 censers, thou also and Aaron, each of you his censer. Now drop down to verse 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation, saying, Get you up from about the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan, Abiram. And Moses rose up and went unto Dathan and Abiram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spake unto the congregation, saying, Depart. I pray you from the tents of these wicked men and touch nothing of theirs lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they gate up from the tabernacle of Korah, Dathan and Abiram on every side and Dathan and Abiram come out and stood in the door of their tents and their wives and their sons and their little children and Moses said hereby you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works for I have not done them of my own mind if these men die the common death of all men or if they be visited after the visitation of all men then the Lord hath not sent me but if the Lord make a new thing and the earth open her mouth and swallow them up with all that pertaineth unto them and they go down quick into the pit, then you shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass as he had made an end of speaking all these words that the ground clave asunder that was under them. 
And the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed them up and their houses and all the men that pertaineth unto Korah and all their goods. They and all that pertaineth to them went down alive into the pit and the earth closed upon them and they perished from among the congregation. Now, brother and sister, I could stop right there. What a scene that is. What a scene. The earth opened up and swallowed that. Dathan, Korah, and Abiram. But I want you to notice all the rest of Israel, they stood and they heard these words of Moses. Y'all get the picture? They seen that horrific scene of those, the earth opening up. It never happened before. Never happened since. God done a new thing. But I just want you to notice now, after, after the folks have had a good night's sleep, they went back to their tents, and they, they continued living, and they had a good night's sleep. And now notice verse 41. But on the morrow... All the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, You have killed the people of the Lord. Can you believe that? What kind of discernment you call that? That's no, no discernment. They discern just as natural brute beast. They don't know the God of the Bible, and they're, number two, they're not interested in finding out. Y'all remember that article one time I read here, just here a while back? Uh, I, I took it out of the book of, uh, can't think of the name of it now, but this uh, author, A.W. Tozier, but the author, he said, what a person, when you ask somebody about God, and they respond, and they give you an answer. He said, what you think about God and what you know about God is the most important thing that you can ever know. Does anybody remember me reading that here? Okay, I'll do it again. So don't y'all get on to me for being repetitive. You don't remember it, so why not? It'll be just like new to you. You remember. Okay. Well, this is the same thing here. These people forgot overnight. They seen them swallowed up in the earth. And they seen the horrific thing. Not only the, the guilty party, but their children. Innocent children. Everything they owned, everything they had was swallowed up. Hey. You know... History, history repeats itself. I was telling Bessie the other day, there's nothing new under the sun. The, we think this is the, what we live in today. Never, This is a new day. No, every, there's nothing new. Nothing new. It's just new to us. We've only been here short. I've only been here 78 years. None of us... Uh, I mean, that ain't long considering the history of the world, is it? That's not even an eyelash. That's just not even a blink of the eye. Look at 42, verse 42. And it came to pass where the congregation was gathered against Moses and against Aaron that they looked toward the tabernacle of the congregation and behold, the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord appeared. Moses and Aaron came before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. Brother, Moses, being a type of Christ, he was their intercessor. He began to call to God to show them mercy. Brother and sister, there's many times that we could have we could have been snuffed out in our rebellion. 
It was only the restraining power of the Holy Ghost that has preserved us until this day. Don't you never forget it? And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar and put on incense and go quickly into the congregation and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord and the plague has begun. Let me tell you something, folks. This is a subject you don't hear preached anymore. You know what that subject is? The wrath of God. Let me tell you, the Bible says God is angry with the sinner every day. Don't ne never forget it. God is a God of wrath. All you hear today, though, God loves you. He's a, they, you only hear one side of the picture. God's love. But his love is to the elect. And Aaron took as Moses commanded and ran into the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was, was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living. And the plague was stayed. Now they that died in the plague was 14,700. Besides them that died about the matter of Korah. So you see, it was not only Dathan and Kor, but all those that had murmured against Moses. And Aaron returned unto Moses and to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and the plague was stayed. Oh my. What a sad picture that puts before us. We see here Absolutely no reverence of authority. Now, brother and sister, how many normally watch the news every once in a while or sometime or every day or whatever? Brother, one thing that really should show me, there is absolutely no respect for authority today. Even in our politics, I've never... I haven't been here all that long, but I've never seen it in my day how one man is so hated by the other party as we have today. And they absolutely hate that man, and they will not give him the benefit of a doubt. Absolutely no reverence of authority. This was the sin of Korah and Dathan. No reverence of authority. No obedience to the things of God. And we see it displayed today right before us in our country today towards our government, our present government. We see this as well as in the church today. Look at, but these speak evil of those things which they know not. But what they know naturally as brute beasts in those things, they corrupt themselves. Now notice what that says in the Amplified. But these men revile, scoff, and sneer at anything they do not happen to be acquainted with and do not understand. And whatever they do understand physically, that which they know by mere instinct, like irrational beast. By these, they corrupt themselves and are destroyed or perish. What we see here displayed in this story is a total absence of the fear of God. I'm sure you've often heard this old saying, there's some good in every man. How many's ever heard that? Well, there's, there's good in every man. How many's heard that? That's a lie. That is a downright lie. Notice, the Bible refutes that statement. In Romans chapter 3, verses 9 through 18, What then are we better than they? No, in no wise, for we have before proved, both Jew and Gentile, that all are under sin. As it is written, there is none 
righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. Now, in your arithmetic equation, what does none represent? <laughs> Zero. Don't. There's none that doth righteous. Verse 12, they are gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips. Whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their hands. Who's he talking about? Humanity. Humanity. People like me and you. That's what he's talking about here. And the way of peace have they not known. And brother, if you want to get a autopsy report upon what you look like in the eyes of God, I've just described it. You know what they, when, a, in, uh, when I was on the police department in St. Louis, they had a, a law on the books if anybody dies of a natural death or if anybody dies in an accident, there has to be within 24 hours of that death, they have to have an autopsy. And that is when they lay the stiff down there and they begin to cut them up and to find to discover the cause of death. I'll never forget, it was one of our duties to go and witness an autopsy. And we went over there and first thing that morning and they had this young kid laying there in that, on that steel table. Blood was, I mean, he just got hit by a car and blood was coming out his, every orifice he had in his body, out of his ears, out of his nose, out of his mouth. 13-year-old boy on the way to school had got hit by a car and this doctor comes out there in his white clothes, you know, how, with his mask on. And he, he said, well, and he took that kid's head. Well, we got to do it. And all the time he's talking, he's moving his head back and forth. And he said, now I know what the cause of death was. He br a broken neck. Flunk, 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 flunk. Uh, I was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. But we had to watch that. But he said, according to the law, we have to do a total autopsy on every accidental death. So they took it. He took this knife that at the end of it had a hook on it. And he started right here. And he just went all the way down. You know what? That was about all I could take. And they done a complete autopsy on that. You know... <coughs> Sometimes we need to do an autopsy on ourselves to see what we're made of. And he goes in there, he said, this is a heart, this is a lungs, this is a stomach, this is a liver, this is this. He began to point out the difference. Right here is a spiritual autopsy report that the Holy Ghost has already done. And it spells it out right here in Romans chapter 3. And it ends up in verse number 18. It says, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The Bible clearly reveals the total depravity of man. When man fell in the Garden of Eden, it just didn't black his eyes. It didn't break his arm. It didn't give him a headache. Brother, he was totally, totally ruined by sin. The Bible clearly shows that man, from the top of his head to the sole of his feet, is totally depraved. He is totally against God. 
He is an enemy of God. He hates God. Jesus said himself, you will not come to me that you might have life. You will not. Your will is totally against God. God has to make you willing. In, in uh, Psalms chapter, in Psalms 100 and verse 3 said, in the day of thy power, thy children shall be made willing. If God don't make you willing, you'll never be willing. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 12, we read these words. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Brother and sister, take heed to yourself. Take heed to yourself. Now these things were our examples. Notice, we ought to learn something from this lesson. They were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be you idolaters. Now when we think of somebody being an idolater, we think of somebody having a, a rock up there and worshiping as God. That's idolatry. Sure they did. But let me tell you, there's a lot of spiritual idolatry. When you put everything else in front of God, that's idolatry. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as spiritual fornication. It could apply to natural fornication too, but it also has a spiritual aspect. God says in his word, he is a jealous God. And if you worship something else, Besides God, that's spiritual fornication. You know, God told Israel all the way. I've been reading the Old Testament I've always, and Second Kings. He told them from the very beginning, don't mess around. Don't fraternize with these other nations. Don't marry into them other nations. God forbid it. Brother, that's the first thing they done. First thing they done. And then they wondered why they had the judgments of God upon them. And that's the same way in this nation. They wonder why, well, what's going on? I heard Dr. Uh, Spruill this week. He was talking about the wrath of God. He said, all we want to hear about, God bless America. That's all you want to hear today. That's all Americans want to hear. But how about the other side? The wrath of God. Man, they, they try to separate, divorce themselves from anything that is biblical in our society today. You can't even mention God or Jesus Christ and not be, and not be criticized by the media. And it's going to get much worse. Amen. Let us, let us commit, neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. That's 23,000. Now, you know what that's talking about that? You know where that scripture will re reference you to? It's over there in Balaam. He taught the people how to how you could get those Israelites, get those Moabite women down there, let them strip off their clothes and dance, and y'all have a big picnic. And they did, and there was twenty three thousand that day was slew that God slew. Check it up. Read that reference. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them tempted and were destroyed by the serpents. 
neither murmur you at some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. I tell you what, God, one thing that God hates, and that's murmuring. You know, I was telling Bessie a story the other day about this guy. He wanted to get close to God, so he went and joined a monastery. He wanted to go to a monastery. He thought, sure, he'd get close to God. But they, they had some rules. They had some strict rules in that monastery. You couldn't speak. For the first 10 years you were there, you were only allowed two words. Think about it. Two words. Well, he'd been there 10 years, and he'd come up before his, his uh, boss or the head monk. And he says, well, you can use your two words. He said, Food awful. Two words. Next ten years went by. He got to say, he got to say his two words again. What's your two words? Bed hard. Ten more years went by. He got to use the ten two words, and he said, "I quit." And the head monk said, well, it's no wonder. I was well, a bit surprised. All you've done since you've been here is complain. <laughs> now all these things happen unto uh, them for examples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. Brother and sister, it ain't enough to go around and say, bless God, I'm predestinated. I'm going to make it regardless. Take heed, lest you fall. Because the Bible says over and over again in the New Testament, examine yourself. Examine yourself. Make sure you're in the faith. Oh, we don't want self-examination. We want God to rubber stamp everything we do and say and act. We want God to, uh, well, bless God, I'm among the elect. Brother, you won't know until you're over there on the other side. You'll find out then. It's time for me to close. I'm not through. I thought, sure, I'd get done today. If I if I'm not if I don't preach on this again, read the rest of this. Cause I feel I feel like I want to go to another direction. Amen. So God bless you. I hope you got something out of the lesson today. Amen. You say, Brother Tom, you present a real bleak picture. Good, you're getting a message. I want to present a bleak. There's there it, it's a bleak hour. Amen. Let's all stand.